and welcome again to our morning service. If you'll just take a moment and share our video so other people can join along with us and let's get ready to worship together. Good morning, guys. Let the king 
concern and upset in heart, Father, that they do not understand the situation right now. But Lord, you are still in complete control of our hearts, of our lives, of our homes, of our city, of the United States. Father, you are still in control. Lord, just calm spirit. Father, there are those who are not feeling well today. Father, you are the great physician and we trust you. We need you always, Jesus. We need your wisdom and your guidance, Holy Spirit. And Father, I thank you for anointing our pastor as he brings a message this morning. But above all, Lord, I thank you for your presence in each of our hearts. In Jesus' new glorious name we pray, and we all said, Amen. Amen. Let me say thank you for turning into our program this morning. Uh, we pray the music has already been a blessing to you. Uh, God is certainly good, uh, been good to us in our church, and we're praying that he's been good to you also. And uh, looks like next week, we're going to open up and have some services in the church. And uh, you uh, home folk, we expect you to be here, but if you're a visitor, we would encourage you to come. I want to preach from John 3:16. A uh, very familiar setting of scripture, but let me let me share that with you. It reads like this: For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Would you pray with me, Lord? We're thankful for Your faithfulness unto us, and we're thankful for Your love and your grace and your mercy on mankind. Bless these scriptures to our hearts and bless everyone that hears us today. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, perhaps no verse in the Bible has been used more than this particular scripture. Probably every preacher, if there's any preachers out there, you can probably attest to this, but probably every preacher has got a sermon on John 3.16 and the love of God. There's just no way to uh, describe the love of God except it's mind-boggling and it's deeper than we can ever love and it's more lasting than we can ever last and it's more fulfilling than anything that we will ever face or have here on planet Earth. The love of God reaches down and touches us right where we're at. I, I've dealt with people, had people, and they'd say, you know, I'm just such a sinner that I'm beyond salvation and no one can love me. And if you're having trouble today in a relationship, you know, it's awful easy to get down on ourselves and uh, we think nobody loves us, nobody cares. But I want to tell you, God loves you deeper and more than you'll ever know or ever understand until you come to him and allow him to touch your life. Uh, in this setting of scripture, the first time that this word was spoken, it was spoken to Nicodemus. Now, what makes this unique is, is that Nicodemus was a religious person, but he didn't have any spiritual insight. He just went to church. I don't know, maybe, maybe, you've, maybe you've been this way, or maybe you know someone that's been in this boat. Well, I tried church. I went to church. I went to church for six months, and nothing really happened except I just went. And I, ne I never felt a change. I never felt all the things that other people talk about in their experience with God. Well, you see, Nicodemus was in the church. He was part of the hierarchy of the church. He was one of the leaders of the church. And he came to Jesus because going to church is not enough. You can have that experience while I was in church. But there's more to being a Christian and more to having the love of God than just having a membership in a church somewhere or being in the church somewhere or 
going occasionally to church. You can have an experience with God that will change your life and you'll never be the same. If you listen to what I'm saying right now, it'll change your life forever. You'll never be the same person. It will transform you. You see, Nicodemus was a part of the church, but he had no spiritual insight until Jesus began to talk to him about what this scripture meant, John 3, 16. He began to try to explain it like the wind blowing. He said, the wind blows where you let it blow. Part of the problem that men have today is the wind of God's love is blowing, but we have the door shut. If you want God to touch you, and you want to be blessed, and you want God to do something special in your life, and you want to feel the love of God to the depths of your soul, you have to open up the window to your soul and allow the Holy Spirit to come and breathe the breath of life into you. So he began to explain to him that the new birth was something special, but it was spiritual. You know, he said, the first thing come out of his mouth was, can I enter the second time into my mother and be born that way? And Jesus said, no, I'm talking about a spiritual reformation in your life. It talks about the second birth. It's not being born again, a man, another man. It's being born again, a spiritual man. The spiritual life comes alive in you when you accept Christ. I've been to church. I haven't felt anything. It's because the window of your soul, the door of your soul has been shut. You come thinking that coming inside a building and singing two or three songs and shaking somebody's hand is exactly what church is all about. But that's just the start. That's just a part of what the church is all about. We want you in the church and we want to be friendly and we want you to sing and we want you to enjoy the services and we want you to enjoy the potluck dinners and all the things that we do. But what we want most of all is that you would have a spiritual experience with God that you could be born again so that you could understand what the love of God is all about. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And it startled him because he had never heard, had anyone talk to him. He never heard that before. Be born again. Explain. The wind blows, but it only blows where the door is open. It only blows where you're allowed to blow. You shut the doors of your house and the windows of your house. Let me tell you something right now. The wind can blow 40 miles an hour outside, but it will not blow in your house. Open up the front and back door and it'll blow clear through your house. And it'll, it'll uh, you know, in the spring, when you're doing that house cleaning, people open up the windows and doors and they let that fresh air blow in. That's the love of God blowing into your heart when you walk into a church or wherever you're at and you open up your heart and you say, Jesus, just blow the wind of love into my heart and into my soul. And I promise you right now that God will do some things in your life like you've never had before because love is the very nature of God. People always have, have asked me, what, what's God all about? What's, and I always tell them, I said, let's start reading the New Testament. But the nature of God is love. God loves you more than you'll ever know. He loves you more than you love yourself. We get discouraged, we get down on ourselves. We think nobody likes us. We find fault, sometimes we criticize because we have faults and we've been criticized ourselves. But God loves you in a way that you have never been loved before. And he can change your perspective perception of what love is all about. The nature of God is love. His nature is, is to reach out and to forgive you of your sins and to love you and to bring you back into the, the fold of 
what God wants and what God desires for you to have and to be. You say, well, preacher, I thought it was just about going to a church and maybe being baptized in water or shaking the preacher's hand or being good or doing something good. Well, all of those things are fine and we want you to do them, but I want you to have an experience with God that will change your life. The nature of God is love. And in order for you to express what real love is, his nature has to be inside of you. That comes when the Holy Spirit touches you and transforms your life from the inside out. That's what it means to be born again. Confessing Christ. I'm a sinner and I need a savior. You see, Nicodemus was born and raised in the church. And I think sometimes the hardest people to reach is the people that's been to church all of their life. You see them, they're sitting in the church and sometimes they're in the church and they don't even understand, but they're mad, they're frustrated, they're upset, nothing's right, nothing's going right. And I've had some tell me, I've been in the church all my life and it's not working. What do I need to do? Well, that was what Nicodemus was saying. I've been in the church, I'm in the church. Your mom and dad's in the church. I heard a preacher one time preaching at camp meeting. He says, God has no grandchildren. Everybody comes to God not on the experience of your mom and dad, not on the faith of your brother or your sister, but you come to God by exercising your own faith and believing and expressing a desire and confessing your sins and saying, I need the love of God. When, lo when the love of God comes into your heart and in your life, it changes the way you look at everybody. If you're critical, it's probably because you've been criticized a lot and you don't have enough love in your heart. But when love comes in, I'm telling you, it'll transform your life. It'll transform your life like you cannot believe. But I've been in the church all my life, preacher. I grew up in this church. I grew up in that church. Wherever you're at, there's people all over the country listening to this. I've got friends in Oregon and all over California where I've pastored that are on this, this uh, cast. And I'm sure there's people saying, I've been there, but it just seems, doesn't seem to work. You're not grandfathered in. You have to have an experience yourself where you just come before God and say, forgive me of my sins. Help me, Lord. You see, the basis of love for all mankind starts with the exercise of God's love in our hearts and in our life. Let me say this, and I want to move on to the second thought I've got on this. But sometimes churches, and if you're not careful, it could be this church here, or it could be another church, maybe somebody that's listening. If you're not careful, churches can become places where the love of God is the last thing that's exercised in the church. Well, I believe in the gifts, preacher. And I, God used me in the gifts. Yeah, but that's not a sign that the love of God is in your heart and in your life. The Bible says that if you love one another, that it shows the world that you're his disciple. So if you... If you want the world to know that you're a Christian, it's not by how the gifts are operated in your life, but it's how you love that person that's unlovely. Now, all of us are not as likable, and we all have our moments when we're not very likable, but when the love of God is in your heart, when the nature of God is in your life, you can love the unlovely person without any criticism or fault finding. If you're a fault finder today, I'm going to tell you, the love of God is being pushed out of your life. I heard someone preaching this the other day, and I wanted to share this thought. This, they used to sing a song, and it was called, the, the church was called the old, the old Ship Zion. And it's an old country song, but it was, everybody sang it. And talking about the seas and tossed and 
all the struggles. If you've ever been, I was in the Navy. If you've ever been out in the ocean, and I've run into people say, well, I've never been afraid of anything. You've never been through a typhoon on a ship in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It'll put a little fear in your heart. That thing will go up and down and you'll see water coming completely over the top of the ship and it'll just, it'll just scare you. It'll just, put, it'll just cause you to really pray and really seek the face of God. And I heard a preacher preaching on this and he said, this is the way it works. As Christians, we're like ships sailing on the ocean and we'll never sink as long as we keep the water outside of our life. The water is the world, anger, frustrations. Sometimes we allow the water to begin to come into our life. We're not praying like we should. We're not seeking the face of God like we should. We don't have the touch of God in our life. And pretty soon we find that we've got as much water inside of us. We've got so much of the world inside of us that when the storms come, Sometimes it feels like we're going to sink. You say, well, preacher, what are you trying to say? That might be a barometer to tell you where you're at. If the love of God is not in the forefront of your life, I'm not saying you're not a Christian. What I'm saying is, is you might have allowed some water to get in your ship. And you might need to push that water out. You might need to push the world out. The world is a frustrating place. Working on a job is a frustrating place. Being in a relationship is a frustrating thing. Having children are frustrating. There's a lot of things that, like, I don't have enough money this week. There's a lot of things that are frustrating. And the coronavirus has been a very frustrating thing for America because it's changed the way we've lived. But it's brought out some things in our lives that we didn't even know was there. But it was that the ship has a little water in it. And it's pulling your boat down. I'm just saying if the nature of God is love, then the nature of a Christian should be to love one another. And if you're having a hard time doing that, I'm going to tell you right now, you've allowed some of the world to get into your life and you need to push it out by allowing the love of God to just envelop you. And he certainly wants to do that. God wants to love you more than you even realize. Now, when you talk about the love of God, I want to share one more thought with you. It talks about his only begotten son. He gave his son. I have one son. I have a lot of grandsons. I can't imagine sacrificing one of them. You want to see the anger come up in me? Mess with my kids. And I will fight for them because they're special to me. I want to see them grow up and do great things. And God looked at the world and he said, we need a savior and we need a perfect savior. We need for people like Nicodemus to be saved. And the only way that could happen was we had to have a sacrifice. We we'll always talk about what a cruel cross that was. And we're just out of the Easter season. And we can, with fresh memories, look back and see Jesus on that cross dying. And we think that was God's son. I couldn't put my son on that cross. i tell you what I could do. I could put myself on that cross instead of my son, but I couldn't put my son, I couldn't put one of my grandkids on that cross. Couldn't do it. Because I love them too much. 
but you have to understand God's love was so deep that when he saw that there was a need for mankind to change and men, a man could not change. You cannot change by yourself. You don't have enough willpower. You don't have enough of whatever it is to change. You cannot change yourself. But the blood of Jesus Christ can change you. And so he gave his only begotten son to die on the cross. The story of Abraham and Isaac tells that story in the Old Testament. Abraham went to make a sacrifice. He brought his son. When they got to the mountain, they had the wood. They had all the makings for the sacrifice except the sacrifice itself. Abraham said, God will supply. He laid his own son on that, on that altar ready to take his own son's life when he heard the bleeding of a ram with his horns hung in, his, in a bush. And God made a way. He made a way of escape. And he saved Abraham's son, Isaac. But God let Jesus die on that cross because he loved you so much. That's the nature of God. Sometimes we see that glimmer of God's love in our own hearts. You know, you hear war stories, people get medals. Some, somebody jumped on a hand grenade and he saved everybody in his company. And you know, the other, you hear things about children starving and the mother take the food that she would eat herself, give it to her children. You hear these stories, that little glimmer of God's love in the hearts and lives of people. That's one of the things that this virus has done is it has brought that glimmer of God out in the lives of people. We see people sacrificing to help other people who have lost so much with this pandemic that has taken and crossed this whole country and around the world. And I would say to you, that God wants to love you and he wants to love you full so that your boat won't sink and so that you can walk into church and say, I know that I am redeemed so that you can see that person you don't like very well and you can put your arms around them and hug them and say, I love them because Jesus died on a cross for me when I was unlovely and I love that person. Maybe that drug addict out on the street Somebody you know, you said, well, they just asked, they just asked for it. They, if they just quit doing that, they'd straighten up. They'd be, some people can't just straighten up. They need somebody to love them into the church. You can't force them into the church. You can't beat them into the church. You love them into the church. Would you bow your head with me right now as we pray? And I'm going to pray two prayers. If you're a Christian, and there's not enough love in your heart, would you pray this prayer with me? Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that the love of God would just touch every life, every heart. I pray that not one person, Lord, would allow anything in their life that would hinder them from having the love of God in their life. And if there's somebody out there that's been searching and they haven't found the thing that makes them know that you're real, maybe they've tried the church and Lord, today they want to try Jesus. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Write our name in the book of life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. See you Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Wasn't this amazing service? We are going to actually be in the building next Sunday morning at 1030. Our pastor will bring a message later on to, to let you know more about that. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We love you.